Hello, I am coming to you today with an exciting new revelation, I feel, about Christmas. Because Christmas is right around the corner. And so I wanted to share with you a couple of things that were on my mind regarding the coming of God, Jesus, to earth. And this is what Christmas story is all about. So let's begin with some foundational work. It's a little deep, but that's okay. I happen to like deep things. And so let's take a look at what I think the coming of Jesus to earth actually meant. And so Philippians 2, 6 through 8 says, talking about Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And so it talks about how he came from this God position and came and lowered himself to become a man in our world. And so what does that really mean? So let's break it down a little bit and we're going to lay some foundational work first about what our world really is. And so this is where it's going to get a little scientific. And so we have our world. Now, I know that we realize things into three dimensions. We have our length, width, and height, and everything that we see and observe is in three dimensions. But we all know there's other dimensions of space around us. And so you may have heard the term string theory um, that scientists have been really working on and studying a lot in the past few years. And in order for it to work, they say that there must be at least 10 dimensions of space. In order for the world to work as we see it happening and working right now, there has to be at least 10 dimensions of space. Um, and when I talk about dimensions, I'm not going to be talking about the dimension of time. Um, that's a great and interesting topic, but um, I'm really just going to talk about space dimensions right now. So our world scientifically uh, must consist of at least nine or ten dimensions of space. What we would call the supernatural realm or the spirit realm, whatever you want to call it, um, this is where other beings, like angels for example, would, would reside. They would live in this space. Um, what I am kind of putting together as I've been thinking about this is that why create an entire universe with ten dimensions if we, human beings, are really only three-dimensional, at least in our physical form, and we only really access and use these three dimensions right now. Why are we limited to those three when there's ten dimensions all around us? Now, by the way, this ten number I'm throwing around is theoretical, um, but just for the ease and sake of argument, I'm going to just call it ten. It could be more, could be less, but it's definitely more than three. So. Before going any further, I did want to just kind of make it clear that when I talk about the supernatural realm, I'm not talking about an invisible realm. It is invisible to us, normally. I mean, yes, it's invisible to us because we're in three dimensions only. So we often think of the invisible as non-physical. And I think that's a wrong way to go about it and think about it. So it, 10 dimensions, they're 10 created dimensions. They're not invisible. They are, I mean, they are invisible to us, but they're not non-physical. They are still physical, spatial dimensions, physical things and beings and creations live there, reside there, they dwell there. Just because they're invisible to us doesn't mean they're non-physical. So this is a real physical universe that we live in and as far as we know and can tell it's at least 10 dimensions of space created space and so isn't this fun so far this is really stretching your mind a little bit and so god beyond space and time outside of it created in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth this is the entire universe and everything in it 10 dimensions of space and then he creates us. Now, the first human beings, Adam and Eve, they very well may have 
been able to access and see these other realms that we can't now. And when they messed up and they fell, that was probably like a veil over their eyes that they can no longer see. It doesn't mean they're not there. They are there. But they no longer could see or have access to these other realms. But they're still there in the entire universe. And um, I'm going to throw one idea out there to you as well. Um, and I can't really go into a whole lot of detail in this little video, but maybe we can talk about it again later. That I kind of think heaven is part of this universe because, first of all, it's a higher realm. Uh, the entire universe, higher, it's a greater dimensional realm. Um, heaven and earth is always coupled together uh, in the Bible. Um, God created the heavens and earth, and there's other scriptures that talk about heaven and earth together. Um, we know that heaven was a created place. It was. It's not a eternal place. It's a created place because there was a beginning and it will have an end, just like earth will had a beginning and it will have an end. And down the road, there will be a new heaven and earth created. Like So that's also a finite created place as well. Um, the only thing that is eternal or what even defines eternal is something that doesn't have a beginning or an end. And so the only thing that is eternal is God himself. God in his trinity, in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So he is non-physical. He is a spirit. He is eternal. He had no beginning and he has no end. And so that in our argument here today, and the picture we're trying to paint, is that He's the only one that is not physical and is eternal. Everything else, including heaven and earth, is physical of some dimension. If it has a dimension of space, that means it's created, that means it's finite, and it will have an end. And so, here we have a universe with everything in it. That is at least one idea. It could be different than that. I'm not going to say this is absolutely how it is, but whether it's whether heaven is within our universe or outside of it, that doesn't really matter. It's still a created place. Uh, there's just some parts of the Bible that suggest that it's in the north of our universe, in the north area. Um, and so I'm not going to get into that right now. So with that amazing foundation and understanding that our universe is a finite physical place, let's get to the point of what it meant for Jesus, the Son of God, to come here in the form of a man. So we have this non-physical, non-dimensional, really, if you think about it. Um, you know, I used to think of God as multi-dimensional, like many, many, many dimensions. But I kind of think that that would put some kind of limitation to him, like he is created, that like he must have been created, but he wasn't. And so... I, I'm thinking that there's no dimensions to him, zero. This would allow him to be not confined to space at all, and he can be omnipresent, more than one location at once. He can come in and out of any dimension, because he's non-physical, not created, eternal. And so, because of... Again, this is something very deep, and we don't really need to get into all the details right now. We can maybe talk about it another time, if you'd like. Let me know if you want to hear more about this. Because of Adam and Eve's mess up and, you know, they, they sinned and a corruption came into the human, it required a human God to redeem them. And so, and, and we always use the term sacrifice. He became a sacrifice and it was, and he gave up so much. That's what that verse was talking about, that he, from God, became a man. And he really became a servant, but he gave up. He lowered himself to become a man. And so what that probably means is more than just lowering in terms of height, but probably means that if you think about it, he being a non-physical being in no dimensions of space became a three-dimensional being in our three dimensions of space. And he literally became... He, he lowered himself so much. Why did he do this? Well, he did it so that you and I could be redeemed, could be fixed, could be in fellowship with him once again. 
we are now able to access the throne of God. See, this is not really a, a new concept. He, when he created heaven, he has a throne there, and now he can go there, and that's his dwelling place. He instructed Moses to create a tabernacle and a holy place and the mercy seat where he would go, and he would meet the high priest there. And so this idea of a dwelling place is nothing new, and so it's very important for us, as we continue on this journey of life, to meet with him in a place. And we call that the secret place. And so I'm actually going to talk more about the secret place in the next coming weeks. Um, because I think it's the most important thing that we need to do as people, as humans, right now. If you're not a human, then you can just disregard this. And so Jesus came to the earth in the form of a physical three-dimensional man taking on physical form a dimensional form now i think what what do we know um we know that you know he was crucified then and he died and then he rose again and he had a new body his body was then transformed and i'm just talking about the physics of it all um, there's so much more spiritual stuff that is really important and you know we can definitely talk about that sometime but I'm just doing foundational physics or maybe that's not foundational but anyway I'm just talking about the physics of it all um, we know that his body was transformed he got a new body um, to the point where you know he came back to earth for a period of time several days and he was seen by people many people and he made sure to be seen by hundreds of people before he ascended into heaven but something was different first of all they didn't recognize him at first he didn't quite look like himself uh, but secondly he was able to walk through walls things like that so the physics of his body changed he could still eat and everything um, it, it was still a physical body it was not non-physical and he ascended into heaven and he still has that body today in heaven um, with holes in his hands and everything, I th wonder if he still is not able to go to where God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, well, the Holy Spirit's here with us on earth right now, but there's a place where God resides outside of heaven, outside of this created universe. See, heaven was created, and so God must exist outside of heaven. He can go there, absolutely. That's what the throne room is all about. But God exists outside of heaven, and so Jesus, even though now he's in heaven with his new body, can he not go back out to this other place where he came from? He still is probably unable to go back to his original place because he's still in a physical body, and he's no longer a non-physical being. So the sacrifice of him coming to earth was far greater than we could ever imagine because he is now no longer a non-physical being we know he's going to come back to earth soon and he'll still need his physical body maybe that's why he's hanging on to it um, i don't know if he'll ever be able to get rid of that body and return to his non-physical state maybe at some point he will but he still needs it for now he's going to come back to earth for at least another thousand years um, there will be a new heaven and new earth created probably a new unit a new universe um, that will be a physical place because it's a created place where we all will have our new bodies and he probably will have and keep his body uh, that will be able to live there with us so this is a wild theory and i know some of you uh, probably are having a hard time with it and maybe some of you are like wow that kind of makes sense and I hope it does make sense. Um, all I'm saying is that this is in the realm of possibility, that when Jesus came to earth, he took on physical form, and he probably will never leave that physical form again. And so he literally, God literally became a man, a sacrifice that no one could ever imagine. And he did it so that you would be saved from eternal damnation, which we all deserve, but he wiped that away for us so this is what christmas means to me <laughs> this is how i think about it and so it's just like a an amazing 
love story that he would do that for us. And the cool thing about it is that it's just so simple to partake of. It's so easy to become one of his family. And yet, I'll be honest with you, it will cost you everything, but it's worth it in the end because we get to spend that eternity with him. So, I don't know. Why don't you tell me what you think? Um, is this crazy or does it make a little bit of sense? And I hope you enjoy your Christmas this year.